Hello and behind me is the Bell P-59 Aero Comet, which was America's first domestic jet. While ultimately the performance was average and the US Army Air Force purchased the P-80, this then took on a role as a trainer. Now this aircraft behind me is particularly significant as it's the only A model left anywhere in the world and in this video I'm going to take you on a guided tour of it. I'm Paul Stewart and I make videos about planes. This includes reviews on board flights from around the world and guided tours around interesting aircraft in museums just like this one. If you're into these types of videos then please check out my channel and subscribe. And a massive thanks to the Marchfield Air Museum in Riverside, California for letting me get up close and inside at this incredible piece of aviation history. They've got a great range of aircraft on display and well worth a visit. Now let's start with some background information. The story begins with the Bell XP-59, which had a slight wing sweep and a contra-rotating twin prop in a pusher configuration and powered by a 12-cylinder piston engine. Then in 1941, United States Army Air Force Major General Henry Arnold visited the United Kingdom and was shown their top secret jet engine under development. He asked for the blueprints, which were provided, and he returned to the US with plans to build both a jet engine and a jet fighter. They were desperate to catch up with the British who had their jet-powered Gloucester Meteor and the Gloucester E.28-39, which is an aircraft name that only an engineer could come up with. The Heinkel HE-178 was the world's first jet aircraft and first flew in 1939, and while it was incredibly fast, it only had a combat time of 10 minutes, which was impractical. Here's a replica on display at the Plains of Fame Museum in California as well. And we have the Heinkel HE-280, the world's first jet fighter flying in 1940. The USA needed to catch up and remember that the Brits sold the USSR their Rolls-Royce Neen turbojet engine as long as they promised not to use it for military purposes, and we know how that went. Bell signed a contract on the 30th of September 1941 to build this brand new jet. To ensure secrecy, they called the project the XP-59A, hoping that any spies would assume it was associated with the propeller-driven fighter I just mentioned. That program was covertly cancelled and the jet program essentially replaced it. The engine itself was called the Type IA Supercharger, again to trick spies into thinking that it was just an upgrade for an existing piston engine. And the trickery continued with the testing where they would attach fake propellers to the prototype whenever it was out of the high security design facility. Both the engine and the aircraft were designed at the same time which made the job more complicated as they weren't 100% sure of its size nor power, so they went with a conservative design. The first XP-59A prototype was fitted with the General Electric IA turbojet which was essentially assembled under licence version of the British Power Jets W1, also known as the Whittle W1. The next batch of YP-59As were fitted with a General Electric I-16, which was later called the J-31. While it ultimately wasn't a successful fighter and never fired a shot in anger during World War II, it was an important step forward as it allowed engineers to learn from its mistakes and provide information about the maintenance and care of jet-powered aircraft. The prototype was assembled on the second floor of a factory but it was too big to fit in an elevator, so they had to break a hole in the wall to remove it and send it for the test flights. It seemed like poor planning, but again, no expense was taken to ensure top secrecy. The first flight officially took place in October 1942, only 13 months after the contract had been signed, which was an incredible achievement, and also highlights how keen the US military were to get their first jet into the sky. But right from the start, it didn't perform well. The engines were heavy, not powerful enough, and the blades would often overheat and break off causing catastrophic damage. The third YP-59 was sent to the UK in exchange for a Gloucester Meteor. It was rarely flown due to the unfamiliarity with it, and the handling was considered to be pretty poor. Like many jets of that era, the throttle up was quite slow, so that, in addition to the lack of power overall, made takeoff unacceptably long and landing quite dangerous but it did establish a new unofficial altitude record of 47,600 feet, so credit to where it's due. Most of the P-59s went on to be used as trainers for both pilots and ground crew. A small number were later modified and used as drone directors and manned target aircraft themselves. Now you know the story behind it, let's check out this incredible example. 
looking at the nose and what's interesting is that the engine air intakes were on the side of the fuselage unlike many other early jets that had them positioned right at the front in the nose. While this did widen the fuselage, it allowed the cockpit to sit lower, unlike the F-86, for example, where the pilot is sitting up high and above the air intake tunnel. This did improve their visibility, but did increase the overall size of the frontal section. Of interest, the MiG-15 split the air into two tunnels that moved to the side of the pilot, hence why their pilot sits much lower in the fuselage. While the large nose would have provided room for radar, which is why many later jets moved the air intakes to the sides, the priority here was the gun. There's three 50 cal M2 Browning machine guns with 200 rounds, and the large barrel is a 37mm M10 autocannon with 44 rounds of ammo. Unfortunately, the vibrations from the engines and poor stability in flight made these weapons almost unusable. Down here on the starboard side is the position where the rounds were installed, and down here is where the autocannon shells would have been expelled below the engine intake. Next, we'll look at the electrically retracted landing gear, which was also novel for the time. Prop fighters were tail draggers, which had the added benefit of angling the props upwards and increasing the ground clearance. But the problem was that the pilot's view was also upwards and away from any potential obstacle on the ground. This had a tricycle layout, which meant that the nose wheel could be steered and their general handling was superior on the ground, hence why almost everyone uses that design ever since. One negative though, was that the tail draggers would lower the tail, meaning that their tail fin wasn't as tall, and they would fit in a smaller hanger, making maintenance and or camouflaging much easier. This wouldn't be quite as simple to work with. The main landing gear was positioned underneath the wings, ensuring a wide track to provide good stability on the ground, and leave the fuselage free for the two engines, as the older turbojets were fairly wide, and we'll look at those shortly. These gears would fold up laterally via electric motors. Looking at these side mounted air intakes, and this here close to the fuselage was the splitter to remove the turbulent boundary layer of air that would move along the side of the fuselage and disrupt the air entering the intake. This structure straight ahead was covering the engine accessories, which are the extra systems such as the electrics and fuel management etc. Here's a photo of the core of the turbojet, and here's a photo again with the accessories included, so this is what that structure was covering. You'll notice that the intakes are quite large, which allows for a lot of air, but creates a lot of drag, which was a problem when the engine wasn't that powerful in the first place. As I said earlier, the side positioning of the intakes left the nose free for the weapons, but their lower positioning did make them susceptible to ingest foreign bodies, especially objects kicked up by the nose wheel. Moving further back, and while the engines weren't in underwing pods like the German ME262, two General Electric J31 GE3 turbojets were used in this model, and they were the first American jet engine produced in high quantities. They produced 1,650 pounds of thrust each, pushing it to a top speed of 413 miles per hour and up to 46,200 feet. As aircraft were getting heavier, lift devices were needed and this came with fabric covered initially but later replaced with aluminium and electrically operated flaps. Electric systems were seen as less complicated, there were less failure points and lighter than hydraulic systems, hence why we saw them used mostly in the B-29 which only had a single hydraulic system for the landing gear brakes. Moving out to the side, and we have the wing, which importantly when compared to the MiG-15 was straight. As with the P-80, they weren't quite aware of the latest German research suggesting that swept wings were superior, so they stuck with the traditional straight wing design. By the way, this object here is just the canopy opened up ready for me to crawl into shortly. They carried 290 gallons of fuel in four self-sealing tanks inside the wing. The P-59B model also had an additional 66 gallon fuel tank added to each wing. Either model could also carry a 1,590 gallon drop tank under each wing, considerably improving their range, but also reducing their performance. Moving further around and towards the tail and the cockpit is interesting as it was pressurized, which was unusual for the time. This meant that the pilot wouldn't need pressurized breathing equipment, therefore improving their level of comfort. But the visibility was poor as they sat low in the fuselage and then there was this higher section of the fuselage sitting just behind them. 
I contrast this with their bubble canopy seen in other jets. In addition to the weapons in the nose I mentioned earlier, this could also carry eight 60-pound rockets or two 1,000-pound bombs or a single Mark 65 bomb. Now looking at the tail, and as I mentioned earlier, they were limited in the total height by the landing gear, which was no longer a tail dragger configuration. Something like a DC-3 could have a tall tail as the whole tail end would sit low on the ground. I contrast this with the Super Constellation tail, which was sitting much higher, again because of the tricycle landing gear, so they had to spread the tail surface over three smaller sections to allow it to fit inside hangars. But I digress, and I think I just wanted to show this stunning footage of a Super Connie which still flies in Australia today. The horizontal section was lifted up above the jet exhaust to protect them from the heat, as remember, the control surfaces were fabric. There's also somewhat of a ventral fin added here to later models to improve lateral stability and a fairly large rudder to help maintain control during asymmetric thrust from an engine out. While jet engines now are incredibly reliable, back during their formative years, they were pretty troublesome. If you enjoyed this type of video and can afford to help out, please consider becoming a channel member. There's no perks yet, but you'll be helping me keep making these videos. But if you can't afford it, then that's fine, but please give the video a thumbs up because that's totally free. It's interesting to see the pitot head positioned up here as the idea was that it would be less affected by turbulence from other parts of the aircraft structure. And here is the serial number 422614. This aircraft was accepted from Bell on September 25th, 1944 and was assigned to the 412th Fighter Group at Muroc Army Airfield. In November 1945, it was transferred to March Field, where it was retired five months later. It was used as an instructional airframe at Santa Maria and then put into storage at Edwards Air Force Base. In 1980, it returned to Marchfield in parts and an incredible group of volunteers and initially members of the 452nd Air Refueling Wing pieced it all back together. This is the only A model left anywhere in the world and a real credit to the team here and well worth visiting. Obviously, aircraft like the SR-71 you've probably seen in the background are very special, but the P-59 is rarer and also an important milestone in American aviation. Let's check out this cockpit for a single crew member. The museum kindly positioned this ladder here and there was a non-slip surface on the top of the wing to ensure I snuck in safely. And it's as spacious and comfortable as you would expect and really an honour to be allowed to sit inside the only P-59A left anywhere in the world. One major change for the pilots with jet engines was a much slower engine response. In fact, the B-47 could take 20 seconds from idle to full RPM, so they'd come into land at medium throttle in case a go-around was required. The problem was that too much thrust was developed doing that so they wouldn't slow down, so they'd release a drogue parachute while descending and lower the landing gear well before touchdown. Check out my guided tour video around the B-47 for more information on that. Now sorry to digress, but it's a fascinating fact and back to the P-59. The German Messerschmitt ME-262 had a mechanical block on the throttle to stop the pilot from accidentally idling the engine while coming into land to, again, ensure they maintained enough engine RPM to go around if needed. Down here on the left is the throttle for the two engines with their large L and R printed on them. Below that are very simple controls for the fuel flow from the left or right tanks. The red panel in here is all of the electrical equipment such as the lights and pitot heaters etc. And looking ahead are all the usual displays with the gun sight above that. Down here is a cabin pressure warning light as remember the cockpit itself was pressurised so the pilot would need to know quickly if that pressure dropped off suddenly. Down in the centre is the control stick as you would expect and on the starboard side this thick tubing here was the oxygen system which the pilot would be wearing when entering a combat zone as they wouldn't want to risk being distracted by a depressurization from a bullet or shrapnel. The red handle is to open the canopy and that's about it. It really is a simple cockpit with just a small number of controls. Check out my B36 or F117 Nighthawk video for contrasting cockpits full of buttons and screens. Well there's no screens on the B36 but a lot on the Nighthawk. And on the way out, I had a brief look inside this section behind the cockpit, and as I said earlier, it did reduce their visibility, but it did provide for a useful storage place for ever-advancing equipment, 
especially when the nose was completely taken up by the guns. And much of that equipment was associated with communication. I mentioned earlier about the program being given confusing names to distract spies, and they also stuck the wooden propellers on the nose when transported and covered the jet exhausts. Now, according to stories, during the test flights of which over 100 took place prior to its public reveal, Bell's chief test pilot, Jack Willems, would wear a gorilla suit and a bowler hat with the idea being that any other pilot who spotted a gorilla flying a plane without a propeller would be dismissed as a bit of a fool. Obviously, gorillas can't fly planes, and of course you need a propeller, so it was an interesting strategy. In late 1943, the US Navy were delivered two YP-59s for testing and designated them YF-2L1s. They weren't especially useful with their poor acceleration from the engines and lack of drag during approaches. Now drag was avoided during its development as they were rightly concerned about the lack of power from the engines. Three more P-59Bs were transferred to the Navy and used for training pilots and ground crew. Their first jet to take off and land on an aircraft carrier was the McDonald F-1H Phantom. Five P-59s were modified to include an additional open-air cockpit fitted in the nose with a small windscreen which replaced the armament bay. The guy in here was to record important flight data, while the pilot could be free to just fly the plane, which again was quite a challenge as no one was familiar with the unique challenges of jet engines, especially the very slow throttle up, unlike prop engines that were very responsive. Another underrecognized fact about the P-59 is that Bell actually started work on a single XP-59B, which was powered by a single GE I-16 turbojet positioned in the rear fuselage. There was an exhaust in the tail and air intakes in the wing roots, but they were too busy with other projects, so the Air Force gave the drawings to Lockheed to continue their work, and that was probably molded into the P-80, which was America's first jet fighter, which went into large-scale production. So again, while the P-59 itself wasn't a successful fighter, lessons learned were able to contribute to other American jets. Check out my guided tour video around the P-80, which I just mentioned. I look around an example on display at the National Museum of the USAF in Dayton. Please check out my channel for many other similar videos, and thanks for watching.